little background about the inspiration for this talk. Um, when I go to conferences like this, and I go to presentations and I hear talks, typically I'm confronted with a thought leader who talks about extraordinary brands like Apple or Amazon or L'Oreal or Nordstrom's, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I just think to myself, well, good for you. <laughs> because um, I'm a copywriter, which means I'm in the trenches, kind of like sweat hog marketing. And don't necessarily get to work with the glitz or the glamour. In fact, this is what I wish for. All the most exciting products and services in the world, and so I'll, I'll give us some of them are pretty interesting, but more likely <laughs> this guy. And as long as that guy is cutting the check, I gotta deliver, which is I think, and I think that if you're here, it's because you recognize it as well. As professionals, we are obligated to develop excellent material, regardless of whether we're really excited about the product, the service, or the brand. In fact, I would say that is what makes us professionals, right? Because we tackle the difficult stuff. So, let's talk about the three categories that keep us awake at night. The first is boring. If you feel comfortable with this, some of you may feel this a little awkward, but could I have a show of hands of people who think they represent a boring product, service, or brand? Wow. Uh, I don't know if the video captures this, but almost all, <laughs> this guy, no, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Who thinks they have the most boring thing? I'm kind of curious, anyone that, okay. This, uh, Ka Kelly? Shout it out and I'll repeat it. Why, what are you doing? Uh, my client makes industrial rollers. Industrial rollers? <laughs> wow. Okay, she set the bar really high or low, depending on your perspective. <laughs> um, who can beat industrial rollers? Yes, ma'am, I can't see your name tag, so. Uh, collateral protection insurance. One among the various collateral protection insurance. So like your box of brochures to protect that? No. <laughs> All right, I, I was struggling to stay awake there. I'm sorry. No, no, that was good. No, that was good. Does any, I want one more. One more. Uh, this is hard. Uh, who, yeah, I'm sorry, because I talked to you before, and you were nice, and you're from a place that, that no one else in this room can spell. Miniwawa? What, what was the town? Menominee. Menominee. Okay. What is your boring thing? A box. You sell a box? Electrical boxes. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. I, um, I don't know what to do for the next 40. <laughs> All right. So I think you get the picture about what boring can look like. So that's one category that's troubling. The next might be the opposite. Or, well, that, that, well, complex or complicated doesn't necessarily mean it's interesting. But when I think about complex stuff, I'm thinking about the stuff that it's almost impossible to explain to your in-laws or to, it, almost impossible to create an elevator pitch. You have your hand up. What's up? Public policy research. That's a great example. Who else thinks it has something so complex? Yes. Did you say math? <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, repeat what that is. A pr pr something analytics what? Uh, oh, mathematical programming software. I want one more. Who's got something? Yes. What do you got? Health insurance. Health insurance. But at least, but wait, 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 wait. But at least you don't have to explain that. People understand. They may hate you, but they understand what health insurance is, right? <laughs> so, no. They don't? I can't wait for you to explain it to me. 
You're supposed to read the coverage manual? Okay. <laughs> so you get the picture. So the, the complex, the challenge is, you, you know, all the things that we learn in marketing and public relations is to, to, to make things simple and digestible, and complex, of course, defies that. And I'm saving the, uh, the best, which I, which, by which I mean the worst for last. Oh, boy. Um, when I was writing, writing copy for dummies, the book, I got some feedback on the thing I wrote about, what do, what do we call those things? Is USPs, unique sales propositions? And I wrote, well, you try your best to have one, but sometimes you don't. And you just gotta, you gotta, you still, you still gotta market. And this, the editor got all indignant. There's always a unique sales proposition. And I said, no, there isn't. And I, and I won, I won the day. So if you get the book, you'll see my argument. Because I don't think that's the point. Uniqueness, I think the point is value to the buyer, value to the customer, et cetera. So, but it is an important and, and, and difficult challenge when, as a matter of fact, no matter how you try to spin it, your thing is pretty much exactly the same as your competitor's thing. What you gonna do? Now, can I, does anyone feel comfortable talking about their, their undifferentiated product? Is that like really verboten here? You do, you are brave. What do you have? Wine. But actually, wine is, Right, right, because you get into all the varietals, right? And terroir. Where's Hubert? Stan, Hubert, did I pronounce ter terroir close? Sort of. N never mind. So I stay here in America. Who else has something really where they feel? It's, yes, ma'am. Credit union. Awesome. But you can distinguish yourself from banks. And over here on this side of the room. Uh, I know you guys heard this. This is holy mackerel. Wire. You know, that's one of those kind of things where you, you, you think no one even remembers, thinks that yeah, somebody has to make and sell that, right? It, like wireframes for the real estate signs. They have to come from somewhere, right? Okay. So thank you. All right. So. What I, the remainder of this session is all about is for each of these three difficult things, boring, complex, undifferentiated, I'm gonna lay on you three practical, tactical techniques for in creating engaging content backed with real life examples. So uh, I need that software but I think three times three equals nine. And even though I'm a writer, I think that's correct. So you're gonna get a total of nine things. And you'll notice as the day, not the day, but the next 35 minutes or so proceeds, what they're really about is just the way we think and orient, or orientate, orient something. You know, negotiate our minds around it is gonna be key. And I'm gonna talk about what kind of thinking we have to apply to the situation and what kind of tactical thing we can do to solve the problem. Let's start with the boring stuff. I suggest three ways of thinking, each one mapped to three techniques. First is, you think something's boring, but then you gotta figure out what's at stake. In other words, why does it matter? What opportunity could someone seize or fulfill if they had this thing, or the opposite, 180 degrees. What horrible thing would befall them if they did not have this? Like, uh, an obvious example would be health insurance. Some may not be excited about it, but frankly, there are high stakes. I don't think I have to make a big argument for that. Another approach that can help us uncover content ideas is instead of concentrating on the product or service of the brand, is concentrate on who? The person who's gonna consume or use or buy the thing, and embracing their perspective and communicating in such a way that that audience understands you're empathetic with them and that can give you an important edge. And then finally, you know, uh, with a nod to David Meerman Scott, uh, I borrowed, uh, I stole uh, this idea, which is sometimes you can hijack someone else's drama and make that part of the way you talk about your thing. So let's take it from the top. Okay, Wiesmann is a German manufacturer of super high-end heating systems. 
And in this particular case, we're talking about gas-fired condensing boilers. Can you feel the excitement? Can you feel the excitement? So what do we do? Well, this is an example of how we can play up the stakes to generate some authentic interest. Okay. Um, they commissioned me after they just completed a successful project at a garden apartment complex. And what they did was swap out all the old boilers with their newfangled modern boilers. I, I'm looking at this audience, uh, you have that post-lunch kind of lull? Right, exactly. So how do you talk about this? I am going to break the rules because I am because the, the copy is so tight it's hard to, for you to see it. But what the opportunity here was is to tell a story that locates the boiler in a context in which we understand the stakes are high. This is what was happening. We're talking about 48, 480 units, 16 buildings, and some really ugly winters. This is a quote from the superintendent, the guy, you know, the super. We feel that at least seven or eight hot water service calls every day. Residents complain about poor or no heat or a complete lack of hot water while free heat and hot water are among the attractive men, blah, 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 blah. The boilers, four in each building, and the domestic hot water they served were part of the original equipment installed in 1972. Here's where it gets intense. Boilers ran 24-7, straining the circulators. They were changing out an average of 12 to 15 each season with a peak season of 22. Each of these things cost $400 to $700 each. And what is it? And each time you have to change one, you have to do a full system drain. So here are people are freezing cold, they have no hot water for the shower, and you gotta tell everyone, everything's shut down, we have to drain the system, replace the circulator. That's no talk about stakes. And as this article proceeds and goes on, it gets even better because that's the negative side of what they were trying to overcome so I don't have to go through this misery. This guy was up at night at like two in the morning when there's you know, the cold snaps. On the good side is they were able to get some court, a green certification, environmental responsibility, and save a boatload of money on fuel. As a consequence of this one article, they closed two or three additional deals with garden apartment complexes representing over a million dollars each in business. One article. Okay. What about the news idea? Well, Pinnacle Strategies, they call themselves a global authority in operations management and supply chain ma uh, management. Yeah, I, I love the duplication. I did not write this copy. Okay, so what that is, it's about um, quality control processes and making manufacturing processes more efficient and lean, et cetera, et cetera. This is the kind of guy you don't want to be buttonholed by at a party, right? Because this is not the kind of conversation you want to have. And they had already exhausted the opportunities of doing white papers and e-books about you know, improving your processes, et cetera, et cetera. Here's what they did. Do you guys remember the BP oil spill? Macondo, right, Deepwater Horizon. So what they were able to do, they worked on the project, they were involved in numerous supply chain operations for them. Big win, $700 million. The cool thing about this is that you're simultaneously doing two things. One is, you're tying yourself to something that people know. Everyone's heard of the BP oil spill, so already there's a recognition where before when you're talking about this stuff, there is no recognition, right? The second thing is, God bless you, you're able to take the drama of that oil spill and, God bless you again, <laughs> and, wrap, and wrap that around your stuff. It's kind of like a piggybacking strategy. Um, the only thing, I love this book, this was great. I wish they had seized the opportunity in the headline because what they did the headline was achieving top performance on the worst conditions, seven lessons learned from a disaster. Snooze, they should have said, you know, seven things learned from the BP oil spill, right? But you know, again, this is, when I talk about the sweat hug part, that I'm in the trenches with you, I face the same problem that you do. You come up with good stuff and then somebody says for some other reason, we can't do the good stuff, we have to do it the boring way because that's our policy. And that's all, that's all there is to it. Okay, third way. Conversant is involved in regulatory and compliance management. Um, boy, that's a tough thing to think of exciting things to say. But they did something I think that's really clever. 
they did a video, and, I, and I'm not going to share the video with you because I don't have the technical skill to do it right and, and, and not have the guys come up here and fuss with, with this for 15 minutes, but the screenshot is plenty. It tells you enough. The point of this thing is, of this approach to the boring is, instead of focusing on the compliance issue, focus on the people for whom it matters. Make them the hero and the star, and it gives you the opportunity to demonstrate your empathy, your understanding, and your ability to meet them on the ground. All qualities that matter. Okay. So we got the three. So for boring, let me remind myself because I don't even remember. Okay. Make the stakes a star. Make the stakes a star. Attach to news. Play up the people instead of the product. What about the complex stuff? I think about this a lot because I do quite a bit of business with professional service firms. And the first thing they want to do is talk about how they want to reorganize your company and make it more efficient. That is a tough sell, isn't it, to get in the door with that. All three of these are really focused on the idea of can we find a salient, a point, a wedge something smaller, something simpler, that'll at least just get us in the door and start the conversation instead of hitting them with the 400-page book of how they have to redo everything in their entire network or company, et cetera.